Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's, today's Sunday service at this temple, the uh, Australia Shoshin Camp. My, my name is Norio Suzuki, the, uh, uh, okay, the priest of this temple. Okay, first of all, we would like to recite prayer to the Lord together. Prayer to the Lord. Alo El Cantare, you are the source of all light, all power, all wisdom, and all love. May you give us light, give us power, give us wisdom, and give us love. O oh Lord, our Father, please protect this planet of love, Earth. Protect us from all evil and open a future for us. O oh Lord, thank you for giving us light. We give thanks from the bottom of our hearts. Okay, uh, thank you for joining this precious opportunity for learning Master Yuho Kawa's the lecture in video. Uh, this is a precious opportunity to learn the earliest early lectures of happy science. Uh, we are learning the 50 early video lectures of Master Yuho Kawa from the last month. This is the first time, so we'll have the master's fourth uh, lecture. The title is uh, uh, Principle of uh, Enlightenment. Okay. Uh, this lecture is given with the guidance of Shakamuni Buddha, which is a uh, part of subconsciousness of Master Riho Okawa, as you know. His, the, his main consciousness is El Kantare. It's a great consciousness. He's uh, like a god of the earth and also the god of the universe. Now, uh, okay. Today's lecture was given uh, October 1987, which is more than 36 years ago. And around that time already, uh, two main books was published, like The Lords of the Sun, The Golden Law. And on that, that uh, after that publication, many uh, avid seekers of the truth are gathering to happy science, including me. And uh, this lecture is the first lecture for me and my wife together to join uh, directly in master lecture. It is so uh, amazing lecture, actually. And uh, in that lecture, he talked, he said, he talked his true thinking as a Buddha to disciples to gather here at the time, around 1,000 people. And he encouraged everyone to, to aspire to become enlightened people like Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva. That is a true uh, intention of master at the time. Please receive that his intention, a vibration through master's lecture. Okay. And as usual, I put, I divided this lecture, it's like more than 60 minutes into two parts. First, we watch the first, uh, now we watch the first part of master's lecture. Hello. A year has already passed since we established Happy Science on October 6, 1986. During that time, this movement grew more rapidly than what I, the President, expected. To start off, I limited the number of new members. Even so, more and more people are applying for admission every day. 
Board mission, we use an essay-based application. But we are receiving more applications than I can read. We've been working quietly. Since I wish to carry out our activities discreetly for the first two or three years, still we currently receive over 3,000 to 5,000 letters every month. I read the letters to learn about people's thoughts. But unfortunately, there have been too many to reply to since this April. When thinking about the development of this movement, in two years, three, five, ten, or twenty years' time, we need to establish a strong and firm foundation based on a clear vision. This is because our great momentum and energy can be a great risk that causes us to lose control. So I courageously decided to take a strict stance. As you, our members, may have noticed, Happy Science is a demanding group. And as a result, the level of our organization has become very high. Today, I've heard that hundreds of people were unfortunately turned away. And that there would have been 2,000 attendees if we accepted them all. Our policy states that anyone who wants to join is required to have read over 10 of my books as a prerequisite. Currently, I directly read your essays and decide if you pass or fail. Surprisingly, I found that every single applicant has already read over 20 books. The passion for reading over 20 books and writing an essay is impressive. We limit our membership, but they try to enter no matter what. The amount of effort people make once they become members is also great. We held a May seminar, then a basic level seminar in August, followed by an intermediate level seminar in September. Since May, I have been reading the truth essays written by our members and writing comments for each one. What I noticed was how fast they were advancing. They have extraordinary passion. It is amazing. Members who took the intermediate level seminar probably received the results as well. If I had been more generous with marking, everyone would have passed. I've already told our members many times about why I introduced such a system. It is so that we can create a basic framework of our activities from the early stages. We are making a model of the activities we will carry out. While there are only 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000 members, so we are running the organization steadily until such a model is created. Once our membership exceeds 10,000, I won't be able to teach them directly. So I aim to raise the level of our current members so that each of them can be a leader to guide the newcomers. In terms of whether Happy Science is a religious organization or not, Legally, this has not been decided yet. But I would say we are an organization with religious aspects. 
Only a few other religions have adopted such an examination system. Some may have exams for executives, but not for the general members. So why do we hold such exams? Even our members have a mixed level of understanding on this. Here are my thoughts. Passing grade for the basic level seminar is set at 70 points. The basic level is equivalent to the Enlightenment. It enables you to enter the fifth dimension from the fourth dimension. The basic level is equal to the Enlightenment of the fifth dimension. How about the intermediate level? 159 people passed the other day, and the passing grade is 80 points. Those who pass the intermediate level qualify to enter the sixth dimension. This is where we set the level. We'll hold an advanced level seminar on November 8th. Those who pass the advanced level will have reached the state of an arhat. This is the standard. This is still our first attempt, so there is a space for trial and error. But from what I've seen so far, these stages of enlightenment are more than 80% accurate. We receive all kinds of answers that we grade and rank in a certain order. Based on it, we can see a clear correlation 70 to 80 percent of the time. Those who achieve top grades are usually the same people 70 percent of the time. And the rest doesn't differ much either. I would like you to consider what these scores indicate. I'm thinking about them too. What they indicate are the members' strong yearning to master the laws. And their aspirations to attain enlightenment. It is very clear. Those who achieve top grades are not necessarily intelligent people. The results show us that the scores are completely unrelated. To worldly intelligence, education, status, income, age, and gender. It shows that each person has a certain different level of ability in enlightenment. What does this mean? Due to the demanding and serious style that we have adopted, we appear to be gaining the trust of society. For example, between August and September, five professors from national universities became members. The addresses they provided in their application forms were of their offices. So they didn't hide their profession. That is how much trust we have gained. Moreover, our members include doctors, presidents of companies, and government officials. Such people have become our members. These people are probably very intelligent in a worldly sense. Some are medical school graduates, so they are probably very intelligent. So naturally, you may expect them to get high scores, but it's difficult for them. On the other hand, middle-aged maids, housewives, or new college graduates often achieve high scores. Highly educated people can't understand why. They think, why can't I get a high score if I am an intelligent person? Such doubts arise because we are establishing new value criteria.
You may think the existing criteria in this world are a matter of course. But the earthly criteria don't always reflect the criteria in the other world. If you liken the value system in the other world to a pyramid shape, the pyramid in this world would often be inverted or upside down. People who are doing absolutely nothing of value in God's eyes are, in some cases, the most highly respected people in this world. Most people on earth don't understand what is and is not of true value. For instance, they think it's important to become famous. To appear on TV, to be well known. Or to work for a blue chip company with a good reputation. So whether you worked for a prestigious or mediocre company doesn't matter when you return to the other world. In fact, it can be the opposite. Jesus once taught, unless you become like children, you can't enter heaven. Even so, some people who took our seminar tests can't believe that young people are getting top scores. They think, I've studied various religions for decades. There's no way young people are more enlightened than me. Age has nothing to do with entering heaven. Experienced people don't necessarily go to the higher levels of heaven than inexperienced people. Gender doesn't necessarily matter when it comes to enlightenment either. An arrogant husband doesn't always end up in a higher place than his wife. It is often reversed. Take a husband who is a corporate executive and his wife who is a housewife. The wife may go to the light realm, while the husband goes to either hell or the astral realm. It's hard to tell from a worldly perspective. In this way, gender, status, or education doesn't matter in the true world. The standard of value has been long taught by various leaders from various angles and ways. But it has yet to be taught in a unified way. Now, I live in this world with a physical body. But when I'm not here, my work is to establish a value standard based on the laws. In this world, some people study Buddhism, Christianity, or Shintoism while others have different jobs as management executives, scholars, businessmen, farmers, and fishermen. Various people live with various thoughts and doing various things. But no matter what kind of lives people lead, their lives will always be measured against a standard seen through God's eyes. So then, what is this value criteria? What is the mindset of a bodhisattva? What mindset is suitable for the light realm? How can it be measured without considering the person's occupation, gender, and age? To make this judgment is my real job. I've been doing this for a long time. I now live in a physical body on earth. 
But the reason I am living with you all on earth now is to demonstrate the true values seen from God's eyes to people in the late 20th century. This is one of my main jobs. I am now attempting to cast light. On what has been placed under the shadow. This is my job. You all work in different places, such as companies or government offices. Although you may think that studying the truth is wonderful, perhaps you still have difficulty speaking about it openly in your workplace. You may think it is disadvantageous to reveal your interest in spirituality. You may be weighing the pros and cons. But why do you instinctively think in such ways? Why should you weigh things like this? I sometimes receive letters from young women as well. They all believe in the truth and wish to keep studying throughout their lives. But none of them can reveal it to their partners before marriage. They worry that their partners will be shocked to find out what they like. And that their values will be misaligned. It's also true for men who strongly wish to walk a religious path. Today, many of them in their 20s are volunteering as security guards and other roles. But they are also worried this will be an obstacle to getting married. Because such a way of life appears strange to other people. They worry would work against them if revealed. At work, people on track for a promotion may be worried about rumors. That they are into something strange. Today is a fine, clear autumn day. So some of your colleagues may have invited you to play golf. But you may have chosen to come here instead. But could you have revealed to them that you are going to my lecture? I'm sure you couldn't. Why? It's because you want to protect yourself from jeopardizing your promotion. However, this is not how it should be. You shouldn't be afraid to tell other people about doing the most valuable thing in this world. The value upheld in society is mistaken. If the value is mistaken, all you need to do is change it, reverse it. We have stood up to show you the new standard of value and to demonstrate the fragility of common sense in this world. The time for us has come to show people what real value is and what kind of people are truly great. When leaving this world, respected people in this world will keenly realize how little their existences are. 
No matter how big their executive desk might be now, they'll realize how little they are before the light of great guiding spirits. At the foot of angels, they will feel so humbled that they will soon start reflecting on themselves. Upon seeing such great light, they will start to repent. This is a world beyond words. It means they didn't know the truth. However, the responsibility for their ignorance of the truth lies with themselves. They alone are responsible, so they can't make any excuses for not knowing the truth. No matter how little they become when they return to the other world, Opportunities for enlightenment were all around them while living on earth. Who mocked those chances? Who scoffed at those opportunities and called them complete nonsense? People will thoroughly be made aware of their mistakes. Enlightenment starts with knowing. There is no excuse for not knowing. Next question is, what do we have to know? You must know God, God's will, and the teachings that flow from God's will. Without this knowledge, you will not be able to grasp any clues to enlightenment. There are many ways to attain enlightenment. You can never become enlightened. By simply walking in the mountains or sitting under a waterfall. The path to enlightenment is the path to spiritual awareness. So you must know what is beyond this world. The first step to enlightenment lies at the moment when your worldly values are reversed. How can you reverse your worldly values? You can experience this through encountering the truth. Knowing means to first come in contact with the truth. The way to come in contact with the truth is to read books of truth or to grasp clues by attending lectures like this. The book, The Laws of Eternity, is my 24th publication. I published many books in rapid succession. Why did I publish them so quickly? These books are, in fact, bullets shot from God. We are shooting them one after another. To convert the values of this world, we must give people as many opportunities as possible to touch the books of truth. Each person is free to choose whether or not to realize the truth. But the task of angels is, at least, to provide chances for enlightenment. Laws are not taught in every age. When the laws are taught, they are not only for people of that age, but also for people who are coming 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000 years later. 
so they can also attain enlightenment. I publish many books, but you're not the only readers I have in mind. In 100 years, I'll no longer be on earth, but a part of my work is to enlighten people 100 years later. What will the world be like 500 years from now? No matter how this world changes, the laws of the mind will not change. The truth won't change. Our job is not to tell people of things that change. In this changing world, our mission is to tell the truth that never changes. In this age, what we teach may not be accepted by the majority of people. Even so, this teaching will become a guiding light for people who will come later. So we will never compromise with the norms of modern society. Even if times or environments change, no matter what kind of world unfolds, our mission is to point out what remains unchanging. Knowing that this is our mission, we must have a broad perspective. We need to consider what we must leave behind for the coming golden age. This is not my task alone, but also the task of every one of you. The laws are not fixed. The laws, in essence, have one main pillar that connects to everything. But this pillar can rotate and radiate lights of different colors like a prism. To receive the lights, we need to have the capacity to accept them. In other words, certain teachings could be unnecessary for some, but necessary for others. So the important point is how you accept the different lights of the laws that are split through the prism and how you pass them on to others. This means you can't just be a receiver. It means all of you here shouldn't just be satisfied by listening to my talk. Next, please change your mind first. Otherwise, you haven't listened to my lecture. It only means my voice is vibrated through your eardrums as mere sound. My words are not just sounds. I am addressing every one of you. I'm speaking to your souls. If my voice gives you a nostalgic feeling deep in your heart, this is because you have heard my words before. It may not have been on earth. It may have been in the other world or in a past life on earth. After this life, I won't reincarnate for 2,800 years. In that time, I'll never speak before you in a physical body again. If so, my challenge is how effectively I can spend the remaining time. My mission is how well I can spend my time on Earth. How many truths I can teach and how many people I can reach. It's not simply about spreading it far and wide, but about giving teachings that touch your souls and remain intact. That is the real challenge.
To achieve this mission, I don't think that to just speak through a loudspeaker on the street is enough. The laws cannot truly be passed on. Simply by meeting as many people as possible. Who was it that passed on Buddhism? It was the efforts of great monks who sought enlightenment. In the world of truth, one person can have the power of 10,000 or even 1 million people. In an office, one person can only do the work of three or five people at most. But in the world of truth, the value, influence, and way of life of one person is far greater. After I finished teaching various teachings, the torch of truth will continue to illuminate people's lives if such an enlightened person appears every 10 or 20 years. This has been the basis of Buddhism. Now there are many new religious groups all over Japan. Officially, there are said to be 180,000. If we include the unregistered ones, there will be two or three times more. However, after the Founder's death, most of these groups are thrown into disarray and lose momentum. Why does this happen? It means they treat the Founder's teachings like an asset. They inherit the teachings to protect their building, land, and daily life and see the teachings as if they are one of the estates of the deceased. But this attitude is wrong. The truth must be passed from one enlightened person to another. In history, Buddhism was transmitted from India to China, then to Japan. Parental or sibling relationships were all meaningless when Buddha's teachings were passed down. The principle is from one enlightened person to another. You may have read spiritual messages from Kukai. Kukai traveled to China and studied under Hui Kuo. China is a foreign country to Japan. To the Chinese, Kukai was a monk who came from a foreign land. Kukai was a stranger. Hui Kuo entrusted the most important mission of passing on the torch of truth. To this foreigner, Kukai. Can you imagine? There are many groups in Japan. But if a seeker of truth came from Australia or Canada, would a monk pass their torch of truth to him or her? It may be fine if they're willing to stay. But could they pass the torch of truth to someone returning to their home country? Although this was 1,200 years ago, Hui Kuo was truly international. He made judgments from the standpoint of the truth without attachments. When Hui Kuo handed down the torch of truth to Kukai before passing away, I assume his Chinese disciples were very disappointed and envious. We followed Hui Kuo for a long time. 
But instead of us, a foreigner snatched the teachings away. This is not acceptable. It seems that they discussed it like this. However, this is what passing on the laws means. The path of enlightenment is a ridgeway running from peak to peak. It's not a valley path. One is not allowed to go down to the bottom. One must go from peak to peak, from ridge to ridge. This is how strict it is to hand down the laws. Personal consideration is completely unacceptable. It's because whether the laws are being passed on correctly is the key that determines the happiness of people of not only today, but also the future generations. So when handing down the laws, there are no compromises. All of you who are studying the laws must realize that you are undergoing spiritual discipline every day, and you are standing at the edge of a cliff. It is as if you are confronting a samurai sword that is pointing at you every day. Without such a mindset, how can you save future generations? Not only future generations, but how can you save the people of today? Even if our membership grows to 10,000, 1 million, or 10 million people, if everyone who gathered were like guests, it is meaningless, it is pointless. Instead, it will be more helpful for humankind. If there are one or two people who have truly attained enlightenment, we need to understand this core idea in the spreading and succeeding of the laws. In Christianity, Paul the Apostle was a great missionary, but his lack of understanding of the truth partly distorted the teachings of Christianity. He was not enlightened enough. This has cast a shadow over Christianity in its later stages, in the life path of Christians. This cannot be forgiven. It doesn't mean that you fall to hell. It means even if you go to heaven, the five or ten percent of the truth you misunderstood will be passed on for the next two thousand years. You can't undo it. So you must all know that there is no end to learning the laws. With all your intellect, life and passion, seek, seek and keep seeking. Even if you come to a realization, don't be satisfied. Be aware of the possibility that there is more for you to know. Know that even if you hear my words, each of you will understand them differently. Be aware of the consequences of passing it on with a different understanding. Be aware of these difficult realities of mastering the laws and enlightenment. Therefore, we must establish a foundation before we start missionary work. We're not doing this to put on a play or a show. In that case, what would be the point if none of you become angels or pillars of light? Don't you agree? If so, go back to the basics and check your awareness.
When you look back on your awareness, are you enthusiastic and passionate enough? Are you thinking about mere gains and losses? Are you thinking about worldly pros and cons? Do you have a calculating mind? You must think about these things first. I am not saying you should be martyred on the cross like in Christianity. Life or death doesn't matter. Instead, you must crucify the weakness in your mind that chooses the easy way out. Crucify your mind that is easily swayed by worldly desires. Crucify the mind that is easily deluded by immediate worldly gains. This is the true meaning of the phrase. Unless you are born again, you cannot see God or spirits. It means you must go through death. Unless you have such a strong, unwavering, powerful resolve, you cannot truly absorb the truth. You yourself must awaken first. You must first be awakened before you can awaken others. Okay, this is the first part. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, very passionate and enthusiastic uh, teaching, wasn't it? Okay, I will summarize this first part in the three points. First is the establishment of a true value system. Establishment of true value system. Master taught that the today's value system on Earth is upside down, like an inverted pyramid, as in the translation. That means uh, people in the top, uh, top people, like in the company, in the country, or in any places, uh, sometimes uh, not have a high, high level of enlightenment, but they are nearly living in as a uh, people represent hell, hellish thinking. So this kind of thing is happening in many places. Also, there are many people who are thought to be a lower people, but actually they are high spirit and they are regarded as great people in heavenly world. That is a reality of today's world, including Japan, maybe Australia and the Kazakh countries. And then in happy science, uh, we are changing, we are going to change these value systems. And uh, we have seminar systems uh, from the outset of the happy science. We have a basic level seminar, intermediate level, and the advanced level. And uh, yeah, and uh, if you go through the uh, advanced level, uh, basic level, it will be equivalent to the fifth dimensional uh, heavenly world. Okay, that's good. And then if you pass the intermediate level, it means it is equivalent to the sixth dimension, light realm, in which all the leaders, all kinds of leaders are living. So you may be, become a good leader in the society. Then advanced level, if you pass the advanced level, which is be thought to be equivalent to Arahan, which belong to the higher realm, uh, upper reach of sixth dimensional world, just under the seventh dimensional uh, Arakan, ah, no, no, Bodhisattva. Uh, these people are great leaders of the world in many genres. So the first, uh, in the first years of happy science, Master Degrees, he wanted to create 1,000 Arakan, 1,000 Arakan. If you can acquire these people, he thought he can change the Japan and change the world through that. But it was more than 37 years ago, 35 years ago. So now, Master Rihokawa, Lord El Kantare, wished to have uh, one million bodhisattvas worldwide. We need one million bodhisattvas. Okay, so we should have a high, 
high aspiration. And then, the happy science ultimate goal is to replace the earthly value system, a value criteria, with that of God, with that of God. So, it is a spiritual revolution, changing the value system of today uh, to the, that is equivalent to God's system. Master told that in the part of his lecture like this, if the today's accepted value is mistaken, all you need is to do change the value. You must reverse the value. We have stood up to show, show you the new values standard and demonstrate the fragility of the, the uh, common sense of this world. So we are not only a religious organization, it is a great movement to change the value system. Not only one country, but the whole world. That is a true mission of happy science. In the seminar vein, similar vein, Master wrote in the preface of the laws of the sun, laws of the sun, like this. The laws of the sun is an exceedingly mystical book. Instead of trying to understand it using common sense, I want you to replace the us uh, usually accepted common sense with the contents of this book. The contents of this book is a true value system from God, from Buddha. Very soon, far more than uh, 40 million avid readers of my books will make this book uh, the uh, common sense of the world. I hope it will be so. This is a true, true uh, hope of Master Yuhokawa, Doru El Kantare. And it is the true mission of happy science. Okay, this is the first point. Uh, then comes the succession of masterhood of laws. Uh, Master told us about the story of uh, esoteric Buddhism. The, the Master uh, Huiko is a Chinese uh, prominent uh, monk in esoteric Buddhism who lived in the 8th century. He was the uh, eighth master, and he has many hundreds of disciples in China. But uh, he actually gave the torch Torch of Dharma to uh, Kukai, who has come to, uh, to come from Japan to China just for six months, only six months. Uh, through this short time, the Huiko gave everything, every teaching to Kukai and made him the ace master. And he brought everything to, to Japan. That thing happened. That thing happened. So this is a truth of succession of the masterhood of laws. It is irrelevant to bloodline, age, sex, nationality, length of discipleship, and other worldly values. We cannot think these of things as related to the uh, succession of the laws. And uh, it will be uh, from one peak to another, from enlightened one to another. This is the rule of the succession. So Master Ryuko him, Okawa himself has uh, five children, three sons and uh, two uh, daughters. We Happy Sons members thought that one of them will be succeeding the Master's teaching. But actually, all of them fail to that because uh, their thinking was different from Master Ryuko Okawa. So, uh, they they are thinking, each of them are thinking differently, and uh, they want to become a new god, new god. So that was that was it. That was actually happened. So very, very difficult. Even the even the expected son and daughters couldn't pass this exam. Okay. Uh, as for ordinary, ordinary followers. We have also have some kind of a, a obligation or a, a difficult task. Each disciple must seek the highest and broadest understanding of the laws, highest and broadest enlightenment about the law. If we haven't understand well, 
the teaching, we can we can teach uh, the other people well. So in the in the meantime, they will the teaching will be become different way way. So this that is very 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 difficult. Uh, no no the dangerous situation. So each disciples must do everything to understand that each teaching very much and high as possible and broad as possible we must we must do that okay and the third point third point the severe path to true enlightenment it is the way to bodhisattva it is very very difficult way but we must challenge that Firstly, it starts from knowing the God will, a God teaching. We can only know God teaching in happy science. This is the only place that we can fully know, fully uh, acquire the truth of God. There are many religions, good religions, Christianity, Buddhism, Muslim, and the other religions. Each has, has God teaching in it, but it's not all. It's, it contains only a small portion of the God teaching or some part of the God teaching. If we want to fully understand the God will, you must come to happy science and learn, learn, learn everything. He master teaches us. And then it will lead to the spiritual awareness. Spiritual awareness means a reversal of the value. We are uh, living in this world for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. We are fully attached to worldly values like money, fame, uh, uh, position, or like that. But these things are irrelevant to go to heaven. These things might be helped in some way, but it, it, is, it is not that we can take back to the other world. So what is important is like love, Faith in God, pure mind, courage, or uh, good good thing like that. So we must change. We must change the value system in myself, in ourselves. Then listen to the voice from God and change your mind. That means, okay, we are uh, before. I met happy science. I thought I was a very ordinary person. But after I met happy science and the third master lecture, I changed my mind. Uh, in some way, another, we are selected by God to, acquire, to aim to become a bodhisattva angels. It is a destiny, destiny. We are kind of chosen people. So we must accept that. The master Rihu Okawa, talking to each of us directly through his voice. He was reaching out to the every source who hear master's teaching. So we should accept that, accept the truth that we are hearing the voice of God directly, directly, and change our way of living. We cannot live an ordinary life as a ordinary people. We must live as a people of God, people of Buddha. So this is a very good turning point. But there is another difficulty, difficulty. So this way to Bodhisattva God is a not easy way. There is some uh, dangerous part of that because when we are entering this path, the evil, evil thing like uh, Satan's are uh, try to take us away, take us away. If we have a impure mind, like greed, anger, jealousy, or like that, you will be attacked by Satan or devils. So uh, example of that is uh, Judah, the betrayed Jesus Christ. He was originally came from an uh, angel, angelic state, but his mind was not good. So because of that, he was taken by the a devil. That kind of history was not in Christianity, but also in uh, 
in uh, yeah, Buddhism and also in happy science. Uh, we have a uh, 30 years history and there are some people, uh, expected people were actually uh, then taken away by the devils. That kind of thing happens. So it's very dangerous. So we should be very, very carefully, uh, seriously, seek the way of mastery of uh, truth every day. So never stop seeking more of the truth and attaining enlightenment as a bodhisattva. Uh, regarding to this, Master said, so you must all know that there is no end to learning the truth laws. With all your intellect, with all your life, with all your passion, seek, 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 and keep seeking. Even if you come to a realization, you mustn't let it satisfy you. Be aware of the possibility that there's more to it. But so this is the thing that you must keep in mind every day to walk in the path to Bodhisattva. Okay, let's now let's go to the second part of Master's lecture. We receive many calls and letters from various religious groups. Sorry. We receive many We receive many calls and letters from various religious groups. Some are threatening. They say that since we started our activities, their business has declined and that we are harming them. But they don't realize we are acting with indomitable determination. They're protecting the worldly prophets, but we are protecting God's will. In time, they'll know that our starting points are different. Will they make a living? Will their group survive? Will their staff get paid? None of this matters. We can't distort the truth for such reasons. The truth is the truth, and what is right is right. God's will is God's will. Without communicating this, I can't complete my mission as the trumpet of God. Kanzo Uchimura declared, I will fight all enemies of the truth. My feelings are exactly the same as his, except for one point. In my view, there are no enemies of the truth in this world. No one is the enemy of the truth. People are either awakened to the truth or are yet to awaken to the truth. We have no enemies. You must realize that there are no devils or evils of real substance on this earth. What may appear to stand against us are not truly evil existences. They are not bad people, demons, or satans. They are simply existences that have not yet awakened to the truth. They too are children of God. It's not about good or bad people. It's just a matter of if people have removed the scales from their eyes. God didn't create humans as incomplete beings. We should learn the spirit of Uchimura, fighting all enemies of the truth. But we must know that the truth has no enemies. With no enemies, everyone is an ally. Some are active allies, but others have yet to realize that they should give support. 100 million people in Japan have scales on their eyes. 
Only tens of thousands have awakened to the truth. We're not fighting enemies, but rather reminding people of the true laws. And rekindling the torch in their hearts. We must have firm determination to advance on our path. We will neither fight nor compromise. We will confidently watch the truth unfold itself on earth. This attitude is important. This indomitable spirit is important. The foundation for this attitude is the belief that love has no enemies. No matter how hard a person's shell called self-protection is, it can never be hard enough to shield them against the spear of love. So when we act, we have to strive to find each person's divine nature. Or the brilliance of the diamond that shines in every person. This brilliance of the diamond is the same brilliance that you've discovered within yourself as you polish your soul. To love others means to love the sacred radiance that shines within them. It is to love their true nature as a child of God. This divine nature in others is in fact the same nature that you have within yourself. This is the true meaning of you and others are one. God discovers God. A child of God discovers and loves a child of God. You need to treat others from this perspective. Then, what does it mean to attain enlightenment? First, it means to discover the divine nature within you. Only those who have discovered their divine nature within can see the divine nature in others. Those who haven't discovered their divine nature can't see others' divine inner nature or help them discover it. So Hinayana and Mahayana shouldn't be separated. We must understand that the seed of Mahayana already exists in Hinayana. In the Golden Laws, I explained that the essence of Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching is that benefiting yourself benefits others. To benefit yourself here doesn't mean to protect your own ego or your own interests. It is the path to make your divine nature shine and also to find others' divine nature that resonates with your light. This teaching doesn't separate you and others. Now we need to talk about how to find our inner light or the God within. As you have already read and heard from my books and lectures, I started Happy Science with the teachings of the exploration of the right mind and the principle of happiness. 
The exploration of the right mind is the entrance and the exit of the truth. It is the pillar that runs through your spiritual discipline on earth and also the lifeline that connects you to God. God gave every person a lifeline to keep us from drowning. In the deep delusional ocean called this world, this lifeline is the practice called the exploration of the right mind. So it means you should master the right mind. What then is the right mind? In my book, The Exploration of the Mind, I have talked about the state of mind from various angles. The righteousness I speak of is not about the duality of right and wrong. It is the value that appears as you dig deeper and search for something true. This is what righteousness is. It is what shines brighter and brighter as you explore deeper and harder. That is the righteousness I point to. In this sense, this righteousness is not black and white, like precepts that say you may do this and you may not do that. In the past, many guiding spirits descended to earth and left various precepts that stated what people can and cannot do, such as, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness. Moses was one of these spirits and Shakyamuni was another. They gave commandments and precepts for practitioners. But those rules were not given to distinguish right from wrong. They served as a kind of fence to protect seekers from straying from the path of enlightenment. They were like guideposts. We must transcend the duality of righteousness and have the courage to discover the brilliance of the truth in everything. The truth can't be found in a simplistic set of rules of conduct, like you'll go to heaven if you do this and hell if you break this precept. You need to know that the precepts were made only to prevent practitioners from going astray in the earlier stages. If a person dies without having killed a single mosquito or ant, it doesn't mean they will be held in high regard in the real world. Even if someone has killed a mosquito, if they have saved and guided, Tens of thousands of people, righteousness will be on their side. Rather than being a good but weak person bound by precepts, we need the courage to seek and explore the righteousness hidden deep within everything. We are not religious people. We are the captain and the crew who have set sail on the ocean in search of the truth. It doesn't matter if we are a religion or not. We're now sailing the ocean of the truth with the same spirit that Columbus had when he found a new continent 500 years ago. On Earth, there may not be any sea or land that has not been investigated. 
The question is, which direction should seekers of truth head toward? The answer is the world of God, the real world. You must realize that we are scientists and explorers. You must change your perspective and your way of thinking. We are Magellans and Columbuses. We are modern-day Galileos. We are modern-day Copernicuses. In this sense, the exploration of the spiritual world itself is the science that explores from the present into the future. Science is essentially a field of research into the unknown. This spirit is the basis of happy science. You've learned that the exploration of righteousness or the exploration of the right mind is a lifeline to God. The next question is, what is the principle of happiness? In the lecture on March 8, I explained Love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress are the modern fourfold path. And the path to modern enlightenment. The exploration and mastery of these four paths is the principle of happiness. The happiness we teach is not happiness in this world or the other world separately. But happiness in both this world and the other world. The true path to happiness is also the path to enlightenment. The happiness we talk about is the happiness of attaining enlightenment. What is attaining enlightenment? It means to realize the true nature of humans who reincarnate. And to know how humans should live. It is to understand not only the third dimensional world, but also the real world, such as the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth dimensions created by God. So knowing leads to enlightenment, and enlightenment leads to happiness. What great happiness is to know everything. No matter how rich or high your social status is in this world, you will be unhappy if you don't know where you came from and where you are going and can't reflect on your lifestyle from the perspective of God. No matter how much fortune you make, you can't take it to the other world. You can't take your status with you. You can only take the pure, right, and true mind to the other world. That is why you must explore your right mind and practice love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. There are the practical expressions of righteousness. The path to live has both aspects of Hinayana and Mahayana. In the lecture in May, I taught the principle of love. I explained that love is based on the wisdom acknowledging equality and the wisdom acknowledging differences. Love has stages. It shows us the goal of our efforts and the path of our training. In July, I spoke on the principle of the mind. I focused on the exploration of the right mind. Now, the title of this lecture is The Principle of Enlightenment. I am trying to teach you the meaning of self-reflection in the fourfold path. 
The fundamental principle of happy science begins from the principle of happiness, then the principle of love and the principle of the mind. And in this December, the principle of progress. And the next spring, the principle of wisdom. And I'll make the basic structure of the laws within a year. Here, in this lecture, the principle of enlightenment, I have to explain how to practice self-reflection. What is self-reflection? I said knowing is the first step to enlightenment. The reason is that humans tend to take the easy way and live as they please. They are content with the way they live. If so, you need knowledge of the truth to look back on your life. And see yourself objectively through the eyes of a third person. This is essential. This knowledge of how God's light unfolds will become light or the mirror in which you can see yourself. The principle of self-reflection asks you to begin by knowing and then explore deeper and deeper into your inner self. Please think, before you encountered the truth, had you ever reflected on your thoughts or deeds? You may have been taught the importance of self-reflection as part of your moral education at school or home. But no one probably taught you the principle of self-reflection as a way to find your nature as a child of God and as the true way to enlightenment. In India 2,600 years ago, Shakyamuni's teachings began and ended with self-reflection. After we are born into this world, we grow up in a family. And are influenced by parents, school, friends, and society. For better or worse, we are dyed with different colors and live our lives wearing colored costumes. However, people are unaware that their costumes are dyed. Everyone wants to lead a wonderful life. But unfortunately, many people are dyeing themselves gray as they live. This is why we need self-reflection. It's the laundering of the mind. We didn't come into this world wearing dirty clothes. The original fabric of our minds was truly clean and pure. However, within 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, our minds become stained with different colors. People whose minds are right are in brilliant heavenly colors. Whereas those who are living mistakenly change to a dark gray color. You need to realize that you are living unaware of this fact. Pitiful are those who don't know how different they are from their original state. This is a very sad way to lead a life. So the first step in self-reflection is to know the distance between your mind and God's will. What should we do after knowing the distance? The next step is to get closer to our original state. What is the method for doing this? 
There are methods such as the Eightfold Path and the Six Paramitas. However, the basis of every method is essentially the same. Broadly speaking, the basic principle of enlightenment has two principles. The principle of progress and the principle of harmony. The principle of progress aims to achieve self-improvement and development. Through individual efforts. This is one aspect of enlightenment. Another aspect of enlightenment is the principle of harmony. Check to see that you are not hurting others as you improve yourself. And that you are contributing to the happiness of many. For example, trees that grow in the way that obstructs other trees will be cut down. For trees to grow together, each tree must grow straight up toward the sky. If some trees grow at an angle, or arch toward the ground or twist, then they will stop others from growing healthily. Each tree is allowed to grow, but its growth must not harm others. Otherwise, there won't be true happiness. So we must aim for harmony as we progress. What is behind these two principles of progress and harmony? The basis for the principle of harmony is that human beings are children of God. We all originate from God, and we are all of equal value. This is the origin of the principle of harmony. What then is the idea behind the principle of progress? Although everyone starts equally, People are rewarded based on the results of their efforts. So the principle of progress can be described as a principle of fairness. For this great universe to develop and prosper, we must realize both progress and harmony, fairness and equality. Everyone is equal at the starting point and in potential. We are all equally promised limitless progress. However, depending on the effort that each person makes, it becomes unequal. The two perspectives of the law that governs the universe are equality and differentiation, or equality and fairness. Although everyone is a child of God, is promised infinite progress. Some people work hard while others don't. And some people advance while others regress. To reward everyone equally would be far from justice. You will get results according to your efforts. This is the rule of cause and effect, or the rule of action and reaction. They all state that you will get results according to your actions. This is the same as the principle of fairness. Shakyamuni once said, Buddha nature is in everything, in mountains, rivers, grass, or trees. This is the idea of equality. But he also taught that enlightenment has stages. It leads to the idea of fairness, a corresponding result to the cause will fruit. Even a good leader or an angel will suffer if they stray from the path. 
whereas those who have made an ordinary start will receive God's blessings according to their efforts and achievements. These two principles are the basis of happiness and the basis of enlightenment. If so, we only have one direction to go. Everyone is a child of God and has the same Buddha nature, but it manifests in different stages. So we must improve ourselves. While loving all things and respecting equality in all things, that's the principle of enlightenment. One of the ways is to remove the clouds of your mind, restore its original brilliance, and then take a step forward to make many people happy as you build a noble character. This principle doesn't apply to you alone, it applies to me as well. Be courageous and take the first step toward further self-improvement. Let's do our best. Thank you, Lord Elkantara, Master Yihokawa, for this great teaching. So, uh, Master Yiho Kawa said many things in this one year, one hour and so lecture. So it is very, in some way, very difficult. I like to summarize the last part in three points only. Okay, firstly, seeking alignment with a fourfold path. Okay. So, what we seek as a happiness is that happiness that can be carried over from this world to the other. Happiness that can be carried over from this world to the other. Uh, wealth, fame, popularity, position cannot be carried over to the other world. Only, only the happiness called enlightenment is a thing that we can carry over from this world to the other. So we must seek uh, uh, enlightenment, enlightenment. And then uh, your enlightenment, your enlightenment is a diamond-like brilliance of the mind acquired through this lifetime. Okay. So that is a, that is a, a most important thing we should keep in my mind every day. Then, first three, we must discover the divine nature within you, within us, divine nature. We can call it a God nature, good nature, the same. But uh, we, everyone has the same kind of Buddha nature, divine nature within us. So how can we find this? How can we find this? The Buddha nature, uh, divine nature consists of everything good in the eyes of God, like kindness, courage, uh, diligence, perseverance, like that. Okay. If you, if you kind some kind of these things, you may, may I can say you may find the Buddha nature. Okay. And then, but this is not a perfect diamond. It is a kind of uncut diamond, rough, rough diamond. So we must, we must polish this rough diamond with the four-pole path, four-pole path. That means love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Uh, four-fold path is a perfect teaching. Uh, using these four tools, you can push the every aspect or every faucet of diamond. Diamond. You can push every aspect of your inner diamond well, using this uh, four-pole path. If you lack any of it, it will become a problem. If you don't like self-reflection, your diamond might be good, but it is it will become dirty, dirty. That is the problem. If you don't like progress, your diamond might be uh, very beautiful, but it is very, very small. <laughs> you, must, you must produce a greater diamond. That is a progress like that. So we should must we must use four 
all four passes, love, wisdom, self repression, and progress. This combination is very, very important. Okay. This is the Sagas first point. Second point is no enlightenment without self reflection. No enlightenment is first reflection. Self reflection is a very important part of the attaining enlightenment. Uh, originally, originally, our state of soul is very pure and clean, transparent, that you can see from when you see the very young children, children, babies. Their mind is very pure and uh, transparent. So this is the original state. But uh, through the course of life, you may, we may acquire many dirt or many dirty colors on a, on a cross through education, mass media, long thought, and other, uh, and uh, with uh, human relations, we may uh, have many that color in your soul. So we must grant these things with self-reflection, reflection. And Master Toy said, the self-reflection is a laundry of the mind, laundry of the mind, okay? Um, but it is not so easy, not so easy, <laughs> okay? If you are young, it may, it may be easy, but if you passed more than 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, like me, 70 years, it, you may have accumulated many that before you uh, enter happy science. Uh, I met happy science at the age of six, 36 or something like that. Already my, uh, okay, it's a half of my years was, uh, was under no teaching of happy science. <laughs> so during that time, I accumulated many that on my mind. So even after I started happy science teaching, I tried to cleanse my mind by self reflection It takes years, yeah. And it is no, 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 uh, no near completion. It takes years to, to, to do everything we, I need to do to self reflect. So, uh, okay. So if you, if you are, uh, if you uh, accumulated many that, while you are living, it takes years, yes. So, but we must do it uh, diligently, day by day, year by year. Self reflection is one of the most important uh, way to have uh, enlightenment. Enlightenment without self reflection, we cannot acquire true wisdom, a true enlightenment. So, as for the uh, enlightenment, we have uh, as. Uh, the teaching of the true eightfold path. This is the one, another important book of happy science. Also, Master gave the teaching of the principle of self-reflection, which is coming uh, maybe a few uh, few months from now in this in this uh, session. Okay. Okay. So, so last thing is. Uh, Progress and harmony. This is a kind of very uh, philosophical teaching. So it may be a bit difficult, but uh, it is very important. The all universe, all, all universe is created on two bases. One is a principle of progress, and principle of harmony. We must leave uh, the axis of two, 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 two axis, uh, two dimensions, two, uh, uh, Created on these two two axes. Okay. First point is everyone is given a Buddha nature or God nature or a chance of enlightenment. So everyone, every people has an equal chance. This is the equality and the basis of harmony, uh, harmony. So everyone is equally loved by God, by by uh and always this Buddha nature in us. Everyone is equally loved by God. This is the harmony. Then comes the spiritual growth is given in accordance with each one's right effort. This is a fairness. This is a fairness. Fairness creates the difference. Two people, if two, two people are uh, 
doing uh, doing uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, discipline, but the uh, result will be different because the each one's diff uh, endeavor is quite different. So this is a progress. Uh, this creates progress. In the principal progress, there come the uh, fairness. It so the equality and fairness is a very different different uh, concept. But we shall use this uh, teaching together. Together, this is very important aspect. Then comes this point. Oh. Your spiritual growth stops when you don't love others. <laughs> so you may try to uh, make growth in the spirituality and come to the sixth dimensional world. But when you stop, uh, but after that, if you not to love, much, uh, love others much, your spiritual growth stops there. You cannot go to the seventh dimensional world without loving, truly loving others. That is the limit. So, okay, we must love others uh, as we strive to become a greater person. This is very, very important balance between uh, fairness, uh, ha harmony, and progress. As you progress in the spiritual growth, you must give love others or harmonious thinking to people, people's happiness. So this is a middle way. Middle way is a balance of harmony and progress. So you must walk the middle way, not only seeking your own progress, but also thinking about happiness of others. Combining these two things is a middle way. And benefiting yourself, benefit others. It's a core teaching of Buddhist, uh, Buddhism. When you seek, uh, benefit means uh, progress of your spirituality. If you seek the progress of spirituality, then you should give others a love or uh, uh, okay, make, uh, make the other people happy. This is a core teaching. As uh, okay, as long as we walk this middle way, our progress is limitless. Limitless. If you divert, divert from this middle way, your, your progress will stop or, or regress in some way, in, in, in some point. So this is an uh, important thing. We must keep it in mind and try to do everything we can do for our progress and the prosperity of the world. Okay, this is the uh, end of today's uh, uh, teaching and my, my uh, explanation. Uh, next week, next week, we have a new movie of Happy Science. It is called Before the Sunset. Uh, it's a very beautiful movie. Please looking forward to seeing that joining uh, next time. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for joining today's session uh, here or online. Thank you very much for joining. Pamela, Grace, uh, Jay, James Bond, I don't know who is it, maybe Jay. <laughs> thank you very much That's for me. joining. That's me, Jay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kancho. Thank you, Kancho. Thank you, Kancho. Thank you.